Howard Marks, thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure, Kelly. Uh, we're here in your offices in New York. Uh, 20 plus years now, you've been in business. Uh, during those 20 years, most investors look back and say it's been a difficult period of time because we've had the dot-com crash, we've had the Great Recession and the huge market collapse. But from your point of view, the tough times have actually been the opposite of that. The times when in the late 90s, equities and stocks and other assets were trading so high and the times before the Great Recession when the same was true and maybe even the same thing is true today. Is that a fair way to to put it? Well, number one, Roseanne, Rosanna Dana used to say on Saturday Night Live, it's always something. And so, you know, uh, I've actually been in the business almost 50 years, and it's always been something. Uh, but uh, I came across a quote from Warren Buffett on uh, Thursday, and he says, we pay a high price for certainty. Hmm. In other words, when people are confident, asset prices escalate. That's a bad time to invest. Hmm. It, the, the confident times feel like a good time to invest, but people who want to buy bargains should prefer uncertainty. And younger people too, in a way. I mean, I remember uh, Buffett making a similar comment about how in maybe 97 or 98, he was speaking to a college group and said, you know, you shouldn't be happy that these stock prices are going up. You should want them to go down. But that also implies this sort of hope or belief that, you know, the society and, and growth will keep going <clears throat> and that you are getting a better value uh, for lower prices today. You think that's still true in today's world in the U.S.? Um, well, the good news is that our economy is the envy of the world. Uh, the bad news, in my opinion, is that it is not going to be growing as fast in the coming decades as it did in the most recent decades. Um, but um, I think that uh, assuming that people, uh, number one, take a long-term approach, number two, will live some years to enjoy the results, and, and there your reference to young people. Uh, number three, will have sufficient control over their emotions so that they don't buy every time something goes up and sell every time something goes down. Yes, they should prefer lower prices. Now, uh, the growth may not be great in the coming decades, but uh, at University of Chicago, where I went to grad school, they prefaced every sentence with ceteris paribus. Uh, everything else being equal, <laughs> we should like to see low security prices. Human nature wants to see high security prices. You own a few stocks, you want to see them go up. Uh, it takes a special emotional control and a special insight to feel better when they go down and thus uh, yeah. present per bargain purchase opportunities. And perhaps we have the luxury of even talking about uh, things being at a high price right now and, and equities being near their all-time highs. But during the first quarter, for much of it, it didn't look like that. I mean, we had the worst start to the year that we've had in, in decades, I believe, right. um, until the lows on February 11th, and then this kind of V-shaped rebound straight back up. What do you think explains that activity? Well, the principal explanation is that, that the market is nutty. Um, you know, and I wrote a memo in January called On the Couch, mm -hmm. suggesting that it was time for a trip to the shrink. Um, there was no good reason, in my opinion, for the year to get off to such a terrible start. Um, uh, there was nothing new, in short. I mean, oil prices went down. They'd been going down for a year and a half. Um, interest rates uh, were raised by the Fed. That was foreshadowed for two and a half years. Um, the Third Avenue uh, fund melted down. That was not, that was a one-off uh, event. That was not foreshadowing anything about the general market. So there was no good reason for the decline. Um, uh, but equally, there was no good reason for the recovery. It was also so quick. Did you That's guys right. put capital to work as soon as you saw prices of some securities fall below a level you were watching for? Can you give any examples of that? Well, um, I, I, I don't give names, but I can tell you that we had a list of uh, 15 or 20 uh, uh, distressed credits that we wanted to buy. And uh, we did, the good news again is that we bought every bond we could find. The bad news is it wasn't many. Hmm. So these price, the term we use in the business, prices gap down. Mm -hmm. when, pri when prices go from 80 to 50, that's called gapping down, not going from 80 to 79. And when prices gap down, we bought all we could but there weren't many bonds. The, the, these, these collapses were not widespread. They were just a few people panicking. 
I'm reminded back during the 2008-2009 crisis, you said you were putting billions of dollars to work in securities every day because the prices were so compelling. Right. Well, it wasn't quite billions every day, but we did invest a half a billion a week for 15 weeks. And, uh, and it took uh, emotional control, which is a theme I keep coming back mm -hmm. to, and, uh, and uh, you know, belief in value. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you had those two things and money to spend, you got some of the great bargains. That raises the question, especially uh, whether you were buying then or whether you're buying today, what are you looking for in a good investment? Is it that simply the price is traded too low relative um, to what you think the bonds might be worth in some cases? Or is it that you've identified businesses that long term you think are going to be successful and you just want to own them at a better price? What are you looking for? Well, first of all, Oak Tree has 25 strategies. So, <laughs> so we look for different things in, in different strategies. Uh, in the distress uh, debt funds, we're really looking for companies, number one, we, that we believe will endure, but number two, where the debt is selling for less than it's worth. In, in the distress for control, or what we call the principal group, we're looking for companies that we can get control of, often through their distress get debt, mm -hmm. but also companies that we'd like to own for several years. Um, are you, you mentioned you guys have 25 different strategies, and in a way a lot of those strategies you pioneered right. and helped to over the decades. Right. You know, back in the days when people, you know, they wouldn't talk about high yield as right. an asset class. Um, is there any territory left there up for grabs? Well, that's a great question. Uh, you know, um, it, it kind of like what we said before about looking for bargains. You should look for things that people think are unseemly, mm -hmm. are unacceptable, or improper. That's the way. That's the way they talked about high yield bonds back in '78 when I started. The ick factor. Uh, the, uh, well, they called them junk. <laughs> and uh, any any asset class that has a a negative nickname uh, might be underpriced. Any anything that has a positive nickname that is on what I call the pedestal of popularity, you're unlikely to get a bargain. So, so we look at the things that are out of favor. Uh, if you go back uh, 40 years, uh, most people would say, well, young man, which, which I was at the time, um, yes, perhaps you could make some money that way, but it wouldn't be proper. Mm -hmm. Now, try to think of somebody in 2016 uh, turning down a potential profit because it's not proper. We know 2016 is defined by the reach for yield, that's right. however that's ugly, right. whatever that's form right. that may take. Most people will do anything that's legal to make a buck. Um, and so it's, it's unlikely that there are sectors which will be uh, overlooked or discriminated against just because of what they are. So it is tougher, and um, you know, uh, now everybody has a computer. Everybody has information and data feeds. Everybody's open to everything. Um, Does that make investing or, or your approach to investing easier or harder? Because it's funny. I remember reading that you know, ten or fifteen years ago, when everybody did start having a terminal in front of them, the idea was, well, if everyone can screen for you know certain variables like cash relative to this or that then everyone will be in these valuable uh, stocks and uh, there, there won't be an opportunity anymore. But in fact, it seems like recent history has been more defined by more kind of, you know, big momentum plays right. uh, than ever. Sure. Well, um, the greatest of all the adages in this business, and I use a lot of them, is one I learned in the early 70s. What the wise man does in the beginning the fool does in the end. Every trend in the investment world eventually gets overdone. Mm -hmm. And so um, you have to be more adroit than you used to to find special bargains. Hmm. Can you give an example of that? Well, high yield in 78. Mm -hmm. uh, or or, or <clears throat> just the willingness to go back in in October of 08, hmm. after the Lehman uh, uh, bankruptcy. So it's arguably, since everybody now knows everything, you know, you, know, you, sit, at, you sit at the dinner table and you, you think about, well, what year did that happen? Everybody pulls out their phone and they know. So there's, uh, what I say is there no, there's no such thing as not knowing something mm -hmm. anymore. Everybody knows everything. But 
that uh, ubiquitousness of information tends to get incorporated in prices and overdone. This year, everybody's talking about the uh, hedge fund hotels. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, you, you run your screens, you find your bargains, you go there to buy it. Everybody else in the business is online to buy it too. Mm -hmm. What's the likelihood that it's really going to be overpriced, underpriced and stay that way? Exactly. So, you know, as you know, I wrote a memo in September called it's not easy. <laughs> and the point is, it is not easy. And I said in the introduction to my book, it is not the purpose of this book to make investing easy. In fact, I want to show how hard it is. Would you argue that your edge today, in fact, is experience? Is simply just having seen so much of this, you know, as opposed to, again, in the past, you might have pioneered a strategy or gone yeah. someplace yeah. nobody was willing to yeah. go or had a better feel for, you know, the, the characteristics of a good business. What would you say your edge is today? Well, I do think that experience is very important. And uh, uh, I think that that's the, maybe the primary way in which I'm helping Oak Tree today. Uh, I have uh, you know, younger colleagues who know more about the Pacific who, and who can figure out things that, you know, that I can't today. If, if they come to you and say, you know, and maybe they have in years past, Apple is going to be a great yeah, investment. Right. You know, Tesla is going to be yeah. a great investment. I don't want to, um, I don't want to be stereotypical of young people, yeah. but in other words, if they're excited about these opportunities and think they'll have staying power, are those examples where you'll push back, or are they looking for different types of investments entirely? And is sure. that where this comes? Well, in? of course, we're not technology investors, but I'll take that as an example uh, rather than mm -hmm. uh, an actual event. Um, you know, I have a son. And when he was in college and decided to become an investor, he used to come to me and he used to say, well, we should buy, let's say, Tesla because they have this great new car that doesn't use any gasoline. My response to him was always the same. Who doesn't know that? <laughs> if there's nobody in the world who doesn't know that, then that's not a reason to buy uh, uh, an investment because if everybody knows it, it must be incorporated in the price. That's what they call the efficient market hypothesis. And uh, they, they taught us at Chicago that you can't beat the market because all the information is already mm -hmm. in the price. That was an exaggeration, mm -hmm. but it's still a concept that has to be respected. And if we are going to be superior investors, or if your viewers are going to be superior investors, they have to think of something that other people haven't thought of. They must have a piece of data other people don't have, or they must have a better interpretation of the data than everybody else has. You have to, in order to consistently outperform as an investor, you have to have something that everybody else doesn't have. So I try to always point out to, to, to my son Andrew and to my colleagues, uh, if they need pointing out, that you have to have an edge. Mm -hmm. And if they think that something's a good investment, they should be able to identify what their edge is. Now, it would seem Jeff Gunlock has an edge. And it's fascinating how your investment in his firm, Double Line, has been one of the more successful ones. And when it's so hard for most people to identify who's going to be a good manager and who yeah. should I put my money with, right. um, that goes back to a relationship with your previous employer, right. correct? Right. And, and what do you think his edge is? And are you surprised at how valuable that business has become? Well, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> but, you know, Jeffrey is super smart. And uh, Jeffrey has a, uh, a view of the market uh, which works for him. He sees, I believe, he sees things with clarity that other people don't see. Now, they may be right or wrong. Right. So far, he's been mostly right. Uh, but he does have uh, special insight. Um, because you seeded him $20 million or so. Yes. And that investment is now worth how much? You think over a billion well, dollars? Well, uh, since that bears on the value of our stock, I won't comment directly, <laughs> but I'll only say that, that w we put in $20 million. I believe the figure for what we've gotten out so far in the last six years is $160 million. Wow. As you say, I worked with Jeff at TCW uh, uh, in 1994. He reported to me, so I got to know him. And uh, 
there's no way to know how good an investor is un unless you, A, get to know them, and, and B, see their results over a long period of time. The biggest trap in our business is people who respond to short-term performance. And short-term performance is an imposter. It's like a roll of the dice. You throw the dice twice, it comes up seven. You say, oh, these dice always come up seven. You can't do that. You have to say that over the short trial they come up seven, but many other things are possible as well. In fact, there's a professor, there was a professor at the London Business School named Elroy Dimson, and he said, risk means more things can happen than will happen. Hmm. It's, risk comes from the existence of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, back to, back to your question. Uh, I worked with Jeff. I got to respect uh, his intelligence and process. Uh, I know him uh, close to 30 years. Wow. Uh, my partner, Bruce Karsh, uh, knows Phil Barish, Jeff's mm -hmm. primary partner, uh, uh, over 30 years. Um, and um, when, when, uh, when they came out uh, and uh, were looking f for help in getting started, they came to us. Uh, I knew him and uh, we knew him and so we decided to give him that help uh, and uh, obviously it worked well. And we've talked a lot about things that have worked out uh, well for Oak Tree over yes. the years. What about some that haven't? Um, what, what stand out to you as decisions that were more learning points uh, than effective ones at the time? Well, we've been very lucky because we haven't made any major mistakes. Uh, nobody bats a thousand. I'm, I don't mean to suggest that that uh, you know we've never had a losing investment, but we've had a very high batting average thanks to the uh, skillfulness and intelligence and and maturity of my partners, who at this point are running the money, uh, not me. Um, but I mean, everybody makes mistakes. So, for example, we once invested in a technology company that had a it was it was bankrupt, but it had a very strong tech advantage in its sector. Um, we lost all our money hmm. because we didn't realize that in order to maintain your technological advantage, you have to keep pumping in money. Mm -hmm. And the, our business model in distress investing does not include pumping in more money, hmm. or it didn't at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so we learned a lesson, and we don't invest in technology anymore. You actually mentioned uh, investing in food stocks yes. <laughs> today. As, yes. So I, I, th I sometimes see you as like the flip side of the Silicon Valley venture capital you know, um, model, they want to disrupt, you want to find businesses that they can't, basically. Yes. What do those look like today? Well, it's, it's getting hard because, uh, for example, we used to say 30, 40 years ago that, that consumer stocks, we used to call them defensive stocks. Uh, and a good example there would be newspapers. Mm -hmm. And everybody said, well, how can a newspaper be disrupted? First of all, you, there's... It's, not, it's a local thing, it's not a national thing. And secondly, you, you need it every day. And, uh, and it's only a dime, so how could anybody uh, you know, come in and take over your business? And the answer is that first you started having national newspapers, the USA Today and the Wall Street Journal went national. And then we had this digital substituting for newspapers. And, um, and so, you know, now the future for newspapers is, is uncertain. I mean, what po I guess that goes back to food. Now, to me, obviously, it's, you know, oh, of course it could be disrupted. Yeah. Everything's disrupted. But it seems there are, you're still finding places that can't be. Well, it, it, everything's relative, Kelly. And so we look for the things that are less likely to be disrupted. That doesn't mean they can't be. Um, you know, uh, but food is an example. I mean, I don't think they're going to replace food, at least not as long as I'm alive. And... Um, and uh, I don't think they're going to create food digitally, uh, you know, like on a digital printer. It's not uh, Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory. Uh, no, or... I don't think so. And, and so that's an example. But, you know, kind of old economy are things where the range of outcomes, you go back to the Elroy Dimson quote, more things can happen than will happen. Uh, the degree of uncertainty comes from the range of possible outcomes. Mm -hmm. So the range of possible outcomes, in my opinion, with regard to the food industry, is relatively narrow. Uh, there's 20 years from now, uh, many aspects of the food industry are probably going to look like they do today. Mm -hmm. But then if you get into uh, other things like entertainment, media, mm -hmm. uh, information, even financial services, mm -hmm. these change all the time. Mm -hmm. And the range of outcomes becomes wider. The, success, the, the good companies succeed to a greater extent than banks ever did in the past 
but, but the failures uh, dry up. Just one final question. Um, why take the company public? You know, maybe it, it seems obvious. Well, you get permanent capital. Um, but you, me you mentioned earlier that the short-termism has put a lot of pressure on people managing money. And doesn't, by definition, being public, uh, you know, get, put that same kind of pressure on you? Well, it gives you the opportunity to have that pressure. The question is whether you succumb. You know, what I said at the time, uh, and there were some pretty good examples to call on, uh, is that you don't have to make mistakes just because you're public. And you're not insulated from mistakes just because you're private. And the question is, do you allow being public to change your attitudes and the way you do business? When we went public, we said, this company has always been run for the benefit of the clients, the investors, and it always will. And we believe that our first duty is to the clients. And if we do a great job on that, then we'll make a lot of money for our unit holders. If we put the unit holders first, for example, take more money under management at a point in time than we should, then our performance for our clients will suffer and the, the company will go to hell, in my opinion. So we have not changed how we do business. We will not change how we do business. And so uh, the potential uh, negative from being public uh, is one I think we've dealt with very satisfactorily. And then it, just very briefly on this issue, in, in, uh, with a lot of new companies today, they seem reluctant to ever go public. Um, you know, why do you think that is? And is it doing more harm than good you know, longer term uh, for them to be so hesitant uh, to list? Well, I think the, the, the main, it, it, where you're not worried about a fiduciary duty as we were, uh, and you're not worried about the clients uh, being displeased as we were, then I think the main reason not to go public is concern that it won't go well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the market for IPOs, you know, the market, uh, the U.S. stock market uh, went from being complacent to skittish uh, in August of 15. And since then, the, the ability to issue IPOs has been number one uncertain and number two kind of on on again off again and um, so I think that's really what's behind it most entrepreneurs if their company has been successful if it's reached a high potential valuation and if they could be confident that the market would be there when they went to list uh, I think they would do would so. rather do it Howard we have to leave it there thank you so much there's so much more ground to cover um, but also a lot to think through now really appreciate your time next time Howard Kelly. Marks thank you